And if you have a folic acid deficiency, similar to B12 deficiency, you'll get macrocytosis. So both those vitamins are kind of like sisters or cousins. They kind of work together. Totally different, but they work together. And if you're deficient in either, your red blood cells get real big. So if a woman is taking enough folic acid or any person and you truly have a B12 deficiency, but you're taking a lot of folic acid, the cells will shrink down to normal, and that's what they call it. It masks the macrocytosis. It'll shrink them down so you will not see the enlarged red blood cells on a complete blood count. That's what they call that you should kind of, people who are on folic acid therapy are at higher risk of getting misdiagnosed, not because it interferes with it, just because the doctor is relying on having enlarged red blood cells. This is why we don't see it in pregnant women, because they're all on high folic acid. We're not seeing as much macrocytosis in anybody anymore because people are eating a lot of folic acid for heart health, for, um, and it's already it's fortified in our grains and cereals, okay? So you're not going to see the macrocytosis we did in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, okay? So that's one reason. And the other thing why we don't see macrocytosis is if you have a coexisting iron deficiency, when a person is iron deficient, their cells and their blood count get very small, and they call that microcytic. So if you have a B12 deficiency and an iron deficiency going on at the same time, big cells and little cells, it averages out, and this mean corpuscular volume, this number that we're looking for that's elevated in the B12 deficiency, won't be elevated because you have the coexisting iron deficiency. So that figure that they're looking for a physician in the blood count is just a mathematical calculation of the cell size. That's why you're not going to see it. And they even say in the, pharma, um, in the PDR and in other pharmacy books for physicians and nurses, et cetera, well, for physicians because they prescribe, you would never, ever, ever give somebody, prescribe high folic acid therapy to anybody who has a B12 deficiency. Why? Because those cells are going to shrink and they're going to not let the physician think of B12 deficiency. In my opinion, I still think people should be taking folic acid. It's not bad for you. You should be taking It's just if we screen people and we're more aware of what B12 deficiency does, it's irrelevant. And a physician should never just rely on a complete blood count because you could have an iron deficiency, a lot of different reasons, especially because we've fortified our cereal and grain in the United States. So, and, and if you look at the prenatal vitamins, that's why I think they do not screen women who are pregnant or during... Um, pregnancy or postpartum for B12 deficiency, and they should because they're at risk. And you have to remember, a lot of women are vegans, vegetarians. They're on the high-dose folic acid. They're never going to be macrocytic. Not never, but very rarely would they be. And so, therefore, we're missing a lot of children who are going to be B12 deficient. And there's a woman in the Midwest that her, um, you know, they didn't screen. Her child is now, this was happened in 2008, is going to be mentally retarded for life, had a severe B12 deficiency. The mother was low, and that's because we don't screen. That's an, and so that's another group of people. Not only should we be screening elderly, women who are pregnant, we absolutely should start screening programs, and they need to you know, document the incidence of it. Have you ever heard of the Life Extension Foundation in Florida? No. They do a ton of scientific research, and you can call and order your own blood test for things that you're interested in. I don't know if they screen for B12. I imagine that you can. I'm going to check. I think that if the doctors do not become more receptive and humble and they're showing signs of not wanting to be engaged in continuous current learning, we are going to have to take this upon ourselves and get tested. Well, I think think two ways of this. I think it's, I think, you know, in a sense, if you have health insurance, okay, and other people who are on governmental health insurance, this is something that you shouldn't, I feel, you should not have to pay on your own to do. You already pay for your health insurance. This is, this is not some new funky test. This is a test been out for a century. It's easy to, it's just we need to re-educate the healthcare community and they have to get involved. There's no reason I feel, I mean, I guess if you have to, yes, absolutely, you, sh- you could do what you're suggesting. But I think it's absurd that you would have to go to that extreme and pay out money on your own when you have health insurance. That's, that's the craziness of this. And, and what they have to realize, too, people need to realize that, and I, physicians are becoming more on board, 
There are actual malpractice cases where patients are injured from B12 deficiency. In fact, currently, there are two men in their 50s in wheelchairs because their physician and everybody who they've come across never contemplated could their neurological presentation be caused from vitamin B12 deficiency. And these men, will they are permanently injured. In the prime of their life, at age 50, they start getting symptoms in their, in their late 40s. And so that just goes to show you, and this happened like in 2010. So we're talking, even though I had a book published in 2005, this is very late getting out to the community. We're getting a little bit, each year we're, we're getting more, you know, people involved, et cetera. But physicians are starting to pr- practice defensive medicine because they know they can be in r- realistic malpractice suits. This is not just new. This is, there's malpractice suits for years, for decades, going on with B12 deficiency. The problem is you don't hear about them because most of them are settled out of court. They don't like to publicly announce them. And a lot of times there's agreements where what you can talk about, what you can't. And I feel B12 deficiency is one of is healthcare's dirtiest secret presently. Let's talk for a moment about the dangerously low values for the serum B12 tests. Share about that because it's kind of like the food pyramid. All that, they found out, was like 500% low in value. But let's talk about the B12 values and how low they are and what we should be expecting. Well, the serum B12, um, for instance, the institution I work at, it goes 211 to 911. Some places go 180 to 1,000. And so when you look at that, it's a huge range. So if you have, say, 211 to 911, and say you come back 350 or even 275, you're going to go, well, that's normal. Well, you're on, the, you're on the lower end of the range. We know, and I remember in, in, when I was in nursing school in the 80s, I remember reading the laboratory um, report of how did they figure out this range. And what they did, I think it was like 50 or 100 per people they took. They didn't say the ages. I mean, they were over 18 and who, who felt healthy, looked healthy. They did CBCs, which we know you can't even go by a complete blood count. I mean, they, they didn't have any health problems. They felt good or whatever. And that's what they decided what a normal B12 should be. Now, what if these, because I know myself, I wasn't really symptomatic at all. I just did it because I was lucky that I had the macrocytosis. At that time, I really didn't like vegetables, et cetera. And this is before folic acid was introduced in the grain. And so they made up this range but we know in the literature that people who absolutely are 350 and lower, they can seriously have a B12 deficiency. And we even found people 450 and below, they can, they're symptomatic. They are suggesting that for health, really, you want your serum B12 to be, really be over 1,000, especially if you're taking supplements, you should be over 1,000. So if somebody has neurologic or psychiatric symptoms or at risk, and say you come back 300, they're not going to treat you because that lab, that says that's normal. You have to be below 211, below 200, below 180. Even the CDC, they write that a B12 deficiency is less than 200. Craziness. So you, it's craziness. Yeah, and if you come back 210, your physician is not going to – some of them will not treat you. There's becoming more and more education. Now, I'm not saying every physician – but the majority of physicians will not. Now, there are physicians that are up to date on B12, and they know about it, and they are treating people. There are some physicians, if people are under 500, they treat. We definitely should, what we could do, there are some other tests out there to help diagnose B12 deficiency. Talk one about is, them. Talk about them. One is methylmalonic acid, other is homocysteine, and another one is whole tra- transcobalamin 2. Methylmalonic acid, it's a pathway. And if you do not have enough B12, it's an acid in our body that we normally have. If you don't have B12, it it uses as a cofactor, this acid will rise. So it's an indirect way of testing for B12 deficiency. So if you're deficient, this methylmonic acid, or MMA we call it, abbreviated, will be elevated. So that's a way of looking for B12 deficiency. The same thing for homocysteine. It's another pathway. If you do not have enough B12, a cofactor, the homocysteine will be elevated. The problem is these tests are expensive, and we know that people between 200 and 350, a lot of times, like, you'll see those elevated, even up to, like, 500. If you are dehydrated 
or if you have um, renal insufficiency, like your kidneys 